I'm sure it you're gonna talk your ear off. Yeah. <laughs> It's a Habitat for Humanity called me today, but I was babysitting my grandson. He's going to call me back on Monday morning. So. I'm always amazed that that works. <laughs> right? All of the elementary teachers, if you've ever been with the elementary school teachers, they do that where they raise their hand, they put their finger on the lip, and, and then it magically works. And I'm an old high school teacher, so I love anything like that that works. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, as you can see, we are getting great and ready to start the new school year. Um, and so uh, when we go out for the tour, a couple of, of advanced warnings. One is we're, in the, we're coming to the finish line, but school starts on Monday. So you might see some boxes or some, uh, if they were cleaning out the lockers, which they were doing on Monday, they, like you might see some debris on the floor. Understand that that is part of the process and we're prioritizing where we spend our time cleaning and getting everything ready. I will say the custodial and maintenance staff have done an amazing job of cleaning all of our schools and moving so that we were able to be ready for our great reconfiguration. Um, the floors are magnificent, uh, rugs are shampooed, uh, we painted many, many classrooms, particularly the classrooms on the lower level. But if you see anything that's not quite up to par, it's because we're still in the process of getting ready. Teachers are coming in every day to get their classrooms ready. So it's, it's a little, we're a little bit in flux, so please, uh, you know, it's like when you come over to someone's house and they say, please don't mind, you know, this or that, that hasn't been done. We're, we're in process of doing that. So I'm Dr. Barbara Malkus. I'm the superintendent for North Adams Public Schools. Joining me this evening is Mayor Maxey, our owner's project manager or OPM, Tim Alex from Colliers, and from our TSKP design team, Jesse Saylor. So we will start with a tour of this building. Um, I will be talking about some of the concerns with respect to infrastructure for this building. Um, this building was uh, completed in the early 90s. Uh, we're well past any warranty dates, so, so some of the infrastructure issues uh, are things that we have to kind of address uh, before they get that much worse, and some are more pertinent or priority than others. We're gonna go on the tour first. If there is anybody who needs to have access to the elevator, we do have an elevator, and Dr. Callahan um, will help uh, people get to the elevator and get upstairs. We'll start on the top floor, go through that, and then go down to the bottom floor, then make our way back to this floor so that we can come back to the order you know, the gym, gym cafeteria, auditorium kind of thing we have in this room. And we will um, have a, a presentation from uh, the design team. So, so this building abuts the formerly known as the YMCA. Mayor, what should we call it now? The Recreation Center. Thank you. The Recreation Center, right, abuts this building. So. A lot of the rooms along that side, like our library, which is just behind you, um, they, they are, because they abut another building, there's no windows. So that is one of the things that was raised as a concern. The doors right there actually go into the gym, which is shared with the recreation center on the other side. Um, but there are, there is an access point from the cafeteria. There is an access point from a stock room. Um, so there's several access points that would lead into that recreation center as well as with the school. Again, built at a different time. And so concerns about access weren't really as much of an issue as they are considered now. As long as we're going past the library, I figure I'll fill you in about this library. So. So, so two years ago, the library 
was the Welcome Center and, um, and still functions in both roles as both the Welcome Center and the school library. As the Welcome Center, um, we were storing some resources for the community as well as there could be community meetings here. The school committee has started to meet here. Two years ago, we, we just realized it was carpeted and I don't know why you would carpet a school for young children in the 90s, but they did. And so we, we were able to pull that out, get some replacement tiles, put those in, that changed really the air quality right away um, within that room and uh, brought in some high-tech media. It's now being reconfigured as a library as we do the grade reconfiguration, but it can still be used for professional development and other opportunities like that. However, it is used as a per, per period class um, for our students to learn about the library because, again, because it abuts the Y, there are no windows other than the windows that come into the hallway. So there's no natural light. So this is where we're going to break off. So there's going to be stairs we're going to take upstairs, or for those people who would like to get on the elevator, you will meet you in the atrium upstairs. So a beautiful feature of Brayton Elementary School is this open area. As much as we talk about those areas that do not have access to natural light, there is an abundance of natural light um, in this area. One of the issues, though, is that the glass that was put in um, does, it allows for the radiant heat. So during the, the people who have worked here know, they can speak to this area gets very, very hot. Uh, we could really have a, a nice little tropical growing area here. Um, and because it heats up so much in this area, it actually throws off the heating system in the classrooms on either side of the hallway. And so um, the zoning for the HVAC system uh, was not zoned properly to keep with that in mind. Um, the other issue we have, you may have noticed that some of the tiles when you came upstairs, uh, there's some water damage just on the other side of the door in the stairwell. Because where the windows are meeting the roof, and the roof is now um, well over 30 years old, uh, and it's a membrane roof, it's a, a PBC, PBC. PVC membrane roof. I'm looking at the experts because this is really not my wheelhouse, but the PVC membrane roof um, had some damage from the air ventilation units, as well as where these windows are meeting the roof. Um, and so we've patched it. We've done very well wherever Bob is. I don't know where Bob ended up. But, but they, they've done, our maintenance staff have done an amazing job patching it twice now. While I've been here, we've had it patched twice. Um, we're starting to get to that place where there's, a, there's so many patches, we don't know where we didn't patch. <laughs> like, like it's now becoming more patched than anything. And when you patch, that actually creates a weakness. Um, so we would need a new roof. Um, so that we, we are avoiding some of that water damage that we see coming into the building. But again, a lovely area, but if we're going to address the HVAC issues, we have to think about replacing this glass so that um, it would not throw the heating system off by becoming a heat sink right here. But it's, it's beautiful. You know, I mean, during the winter, it's lovely. I'm one of those people I would come in here. Oh, yeah. You know, but, but at the summertime, we can't use this floor because it just gets too hot. Um, and then a Head Start, which uses two classrooms on this floor, which is designed for the younger students, the youngest students, um, they had to do uh, some electrical work in order to bring AC in because they run a year-round program. All right. Let's walk over here to where we have the kindergarten classrooms. And this is what I meant about teachers have been in, we're getting ready, we're unpacking things. Please be careful walking through. This is 
so this is being set up as a pre-k classroom um, and so that's why it's got got all all the things that you would normally see in a pre-k classroom um, and some of our classrooms were built specifically for younger students on this floor and so they have access to, to the smaller bathrooms right you need to have a bathroom for that's appropriate to a little person but we they're limited there's not enough of them because they were expecting full day kindergarten not pre-k as well Let's acknowledge the teacher who's here on her own time getting her classroom set up. <laughs> you. Thank you so much. Um, so as you walk by, I just wanted to point out, like, like there, there, again, in this building, it's more about infrastructure issues. So there are some plumbing issues. Because uh, in the 90s, you could still use lead solder, which, um, becomes an issue. We have our te water tested regularly. We don't tend to use these sinks for drinking water. We use the water fountains that have filtration on them for that purpose because we have had um, some issues identified with uh, lead ions being present in the water. So we've, we've mitigated that um, satisfactorily for the state, but that is uh, continues to be an issue. And now that this is a building that houses our youngest students, it raises that as a higher priority. We're gonna walk through the limited number of bathrooms. Remember I just said we wanna have bathrooms for little people. That classroom does not have access to the bathrooms. This classroom does, which is also really helpful um, to be able to have access to a bathroom for small people who are still learning um, on how to wait, right? Okay, so we'll just cut through here. Oh, Michelle, hi. hi. I'm bringing a lot of people in. Oh, okay. It's a work in progress. Hello. Uh -huh. How are you? Hi, Anne. <laughs> so, it's a little messy. We're intruding on you. That's okay. Sorry, I have to. Hi, how are you? Well, no, I meant oh, everyone, everyone can't squeeze in between us. I know, right? I feel like. She wasn't lying. There are a lot of things to do. She wasn't fitting. It's okay. You're just keeping it to her. Thank you. Again, let's acknowledge the pre-K teacher who's in on her own time, getting her classroom ready. Thank you, Michelle. Of course. And she brought helpers. Yes, baby's here. So, uh... We do have, we have a lot of work going on to get the school ready for the opening with the kids. Um, again, this was designed to be a classroom for smaller children. So nice pre-K space. Teacher is setting it up beautifully. We have access to windows on this side of the building, but we'll now go over to the other side of the building and take a look at some of the classroom spaces over there. We've replaced a lot of tiles in these classrooms <coughs> this summer. Um, some of them had some water damage, so we wanted to make sure they start off with nice clean tiles, cleaned floors, shampooed rugs. The rugs are original, um, and so we, we clean them every break 
uh, because these are little little people and they and we do breakfast in the classroom so there they need to be shampooed regularly in order to maintain them. Sorry, can I just? All right, cameraman. We're going to show off. Yeah. So yeah, there's a big contrast between those two. Hi, good, how are you? And I've got to say, this is the third classroom we're walking into with a teacher and it's setting up her room and I didn't ask them to do that. They're here and it's a surprise to me too. So thank you so much. Our teachers do a great job. So this is a, like a teacher rug that Michelle has brought in and this is the original carpet. Which you can tell it's kind of got that look to it, so. All right, we got people? Yes, please, please be careful. There's so much stuff out. So this is a, a corner classroom. There is some access to windows. Just half a wall of, of windows over there because Again, now we're coming into the side that we share with the recreation center. So as we go into our next classroom, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Switch there just so that they. What classroom is this? They seem like they're all like kindergarten. Kindergarten pre K, up on this floor. All kindergarten and pre K. We're the largest pre K provider in the North Adams Public Schools. Um, so this room, because it's now we're hitting that place where we are shared space with the recreation center and there's no ambient light coming in from the hallway. Um, this room was painted to try to make it brighter. Um, obviously fully carpeted so again wash this rug and replace some ceiling tiles in order to make it brighter. The, the hard part is for smaller little children, right? No, no immediate access to bathroom. They're going to have to go out in the hall or across the hall into that other classroom. Um, but nice big spaces, lots of storage in this school. Those were the things that they were thinking about as this school was being built. Um, really cr like thinking about education differently. And later on when I talk about the education plan, that was the work of many stakeholders from the community. Um, that's what, what happens as you build a new school. You're thinking about what is the education plan going forward. And they did that in this building. They did create nice, large size classrooms, um, and the, but very industrial, right? There was more of an industrial model to education at that time. And I don't know if I'd have to, okay. Let me turn the lights on. All right, I'm not taking you in there because it's dark, and to get to the lights, I have to cross through the entire room. You need a cell phone light? Right? You want a cell phone light? Yeah. Like most houses. Jim's getting there. Okay. That was a good idea, Joe. Thank you. All right. <laughs> you have light. My high school was actually like this. Yeah. It was, it, it the, was built. The 90s. It was, well, my high school <laughs> was like 90s. late 70s, early 90s. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 
So we have some furniture blocking this, but if you go, you can access every classroom on each side of the hallway um, until, you, until you hit the middle wall. And that can be an issue because now I, with three entrances, that's a safety concern because if somebody, an intruder into the building can get into this classroom, they can actually get into all the classrooms. So that's a, a safety concern. But it continues going that way. Locked, right? I mean, they would stay they don't, these interior doors do not lock. You can't put a lock on them, though? I know, that's what I'm No, they'd about. have to be replaced. To add, the locking mechanism would have to be replaced. So it's a door handle. Yeah. The, door the, handle. the only doors that are locking doors are to the hallway. Mm -hmm. And they're not um, safety-proof doors either. Like, these are, these are interior doors. Jesse, do you have a better way of explaining I that safety about, concern? I know, I know about doors. <laughs> Which one is it? That, that the interior doors, they don't lock, they're interior doors, they're easy to access through. Sure, yeah, then you can't really secure a room, right? So you never but you can get a doorknob with a new lock on it. You could, yeah. yeah. It's not and the end it's of the pretty, world. Right. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Like, do it by some point. So, so for those of you who just came in, I was just saying this is the other classroom that actually has bathrooms in the classroom, um, but otherwise they have to use those bathrooms that are in the main center hallway. That's it. Those are the only bathrooms on this floor. And again, when you have littles who, do, who are still learning to, to wait. <laughs> so that bathroom goes to just this room here? Yeah, that, that's the only entrance. Yeah. Well, it seems like the chair is this high and the toilet's that high. No, there's a little one. They're little. They're, they're little. They're, they're, little. Little. they're the little, little toilets. Which one? The, in these bathrooms. The, they go down around here. They're little, little. You see the little? It's a lot higher than those chairs are if they fit in those chairs. Yeah, those chairs are actually used for students who can't sit on the floor, like when the teacher says, all right, everybody sit on your spot on the floor. They will use these chairs because they um, it, they get sensory issues, um, or they could just be a nudge, and then the teacher will put them in that bag. All these tiles and the ceiling need to be replaced too. Many tiles were replaced this summer. If we had any tiles that had very, you know, obvious water damage or staining, they were replaced. In some cases, whole classrooms ended up getting replaced. Oh, these warp about every three or four years. Yes. Yeah, the drop ceilings do have their issues. You going to replace it with the same thing? Well, if, if we are staying here, this is what we have. So now we're going to go past the, the main floor, the ground level floor, and we're going to go to the subterranean classroom floor. There's three levels in Brayton. The first one is actually below ground level. The main level is at ground level, and then this is the second story above that. So the three levels, the first level is actually subterranean. So that's the one we're going to. So two staircases down. Do you have a question? Are there any questions? Yeah, if you want to use the elevator, absolutely. Tan, where are you? He's out there. He will, he will bring you to the elevator and we'll meet you on the this way. That have low level windows because we are subterranean so you can see where we have the you know the windows are high up on the the wall um and then we have a bunch of classrooms again from where we abut the recreation center that have no windows but then in our music room they also have no windows and that is even on the other side but they didn't put windows in that so so we are below ground level Again, original carpet. Um, we, in this room particularly, we had some concrete spalling that led to flooding. And it was, happened like late June when school was closed. And this area gets very tropical. It's hot and steamy in here during the summer. So we don't normally use this level when we're working in our summer programs. So it sat closed up. Water, seepage, closed up, hot. How old is this building? 
1994 uh, is what the plaque says. How old? It says 1994 on the dedication plaque. Yeah. Okay. 30 yeah. years. Did they even think of all this when they were designing us? That wasn't that long ago. 30 years. I, I can't speak to that because I don't know who was on the school building committee at that time and what their thoughts were. They did a lot of the right things, but they also built it at a time where long hallways, lockers. I was told at one point, and I've never been able to verify it, that this was actually built in, intentionally to be a middle school, and it was only the little, littles were added in later on. It, but I can't verify that for you. But I but somebody did say that to me. So in this room we did have a mold issue. It has been mitigated for mold. All of these rooms on this level were painted this summer. We hired some summer help. And I want to tell you it was our valedictorian from Drury High School who worked for us, who painted all these rooms using paint that will diminish the um, mold. But we will have to keep doing that, right? Because it's subterranean. And so um, this room, that it was disinfected, painted, uh, you know, new lights, new ceiling tiles, you know, from the drop ceiling put in. Um, I would love to say there is no mold or mildew. However, I don't know what's under this carpet. And I'm not really sure I ever want to find out. Mm -hmm. Is there like air like filtration? That, no. Is there any sort yeah, of like no. HIPAA filter? Because you're going to put kids here for the next three years, right? So, so thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Because my because kid is going to be here. And it's we, in all bizarre. of the rooms that have no windows, there are two dehumidifiers in each room. And all of these classrooms, because during COVID, we ended up buying additional air filtration, portable air filtration mm -hmm. systems. We're putting those into all of these classrooms down here, as well as we have contacted our uh, provider, our CTC provider, and they are upping the air exchange rate for these rooms. There are three dampers on the roof that are specific to these rooms. We're going to, they're going to be at 75% new air coming in. You can smell down here, there's no scent of mildew, there's no scent of mold. There will be the scent of sweaty bodies, <laughs> right? That, a, a hot day down here, that you're going to get that. Um, but as I said, our maintenance and custodial staff do an amazing job. You know, they, they wash this carpet particularly every break we have right just to make sure because this we can do that maintenance in the classrooms um and in some of the classrooms this classroom and that classroom we did pull the carpeting out but this stretch of carpeting because we don't know there's no guarantee that there's tile under it because there wasn't tile under any of the other floors we would have to get tiling and that comes at a cost okay are there, any sprinkler systems? there is no sprinkler systems in the design of this building. None? None. So in the case of a fire, okay. That's not good. Right. There is no sprinkler system in this building. It was not required in okay. the early 90s. I just so. noticed I don't see any. That's why I was curious. No, no. You were right. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, a nice little classroom. You can see we've got some nice windows there. It does allow in some natural light. Teacher's done a great job setting up. Yeah. That teacher looks ready to go. So, so we're currently coming into where the atrium was on the third floor. This is kind of like the little hallway area where the elevator is. All of the classrooms as we go from here going down this hallway no windows, so either side. So, so this side, what we've done is we've made a technology storage, right? So lots of technology in here. A uh, little office space, and then some more office space. But we're not going to put full-on classroom or children's spaces where we don't have access to natural light. 
Now, this is the music room in OTPT. So this is OTPT, um, music room, again. But kids aren't here all day. They're, they are here per period. That's a fun room. <laughs> a little meeting space for teachers. A little we had to have a teacher space on every floor. So how many of the rooms are actually used during the school se school season? Like how many rooms? There's like are all the rooms full when the school stays? Yes. Yeah. So the only room rooms that we're using as storage are the two technology rooms over here, the office spaces over here. Try to stay out of the dark. And that's basically. all three floors. But this is OTPT. We've, we've got kids in here every period. Yep. You know. And then this is our. I feel like I'm shopping for a house. <laughs> that's just storage. Sixty-five million dollar house. Sixty-five million dollar house. Yes. And our little art room. That's the only windows we have, but they did build the art rooms to have sinks. Um, we brought in these lab tables that were from a, a, the area where they, we now have technology. So these are good, durable tops. They'll be able to paint on these and do all kinds of art work. There's no enclosed storage area, but you can see the teachers kind of created one there. Um, so that she has a storage space for all the supplies associated with teaching and art class. So, this, so we have windows. We're going to use this as a classroom. And do you want to see? We do have a substantially separate couple of classrooms on the other side of this, um, but they look just like this, basically. So maybe we'll just head up the hallway, head up to main floor. Feel free to roam down to the other classrooms. That door does lead to the Y side. So this has become a teacher's um, staff room. During COVID, we had to use this as part of the nursing suite. Um, and there is actually a nursing suite here. They have a full medical suite, um, which was great because they had separate rooms. So because of HIPAA, but also because of prevent disease prevention, we could separate kids uh, apart, far enough apart if they became symptomatic for COVID. Out that way, which we didn't go to, is the only loading dock besides Drury High School for the entire district. Mm -hmm. So all supplies end up getting delivered here and then redistributed out. So that was another smart investment when building this project was that they included a loading dock so that you could in fact, um, receive goods and services and not have them all just coming to Drury because Drury receives a lot of supplies associated with a high school. So this brings us back to where we were. Um, I want to honor people's time tonight. Thank you so much for being here and taking this tour. I, I want to say that, first off, I want to acknowledge Mr. Flaherty. Please stand up. Um, Director of Facilities, uh, he and his staff have done such an amazing job really cleaning, painting, um, scrubbing, disinfecting, multiple washes of carpeting. Um, you and your staff have done an amazing Thank job, you. seriously, it really, to, to the casual observer, looks like we're getting ready for school. And that is, was our goal. What you don't see is the infrastructure issues. The roof. The fact that we don't have a sprinkler system in this building. If we prioritize having a sprinkler system, then we also have to address the electrical issues. This, this building was wired with the recreation center. And we spend an inordinate amount of money, almost three times the amount of money on our utility bills for electricity in this building because of that, as well as the fact that maybe the splitters that went in for Head Start 
Um, Bob has done a great job really trying to track down where those costs are coming from. Part of it is, is that many of these, that a lot of the electrical system in this building was done in series. And so uh, that impacts uh, just the, the usefulness uh, and the efficiency of the energy that's being used. I have a question uh, about the sprinklers. Has, has anybody checked into what it's going to cost to put that in? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have. Price? You have a yeah. price? Yeah. Well, well, two years ago, it was 1.2 million. Which are the 65 million. And it could be more once you start And that's the thing. Once you open a project, right now they are going to look at your ADA, right? And that means the city has to look at the sidewalks outside, right? Um, driveway, right? Um, so roof, HVAC, sprinkler system, electricity. It is it is high ticket infrastructure items and I'm not as well uh, knowledgeable of about the particulars but I know that our designer is and he can speak to that as well as well what does this new building project look like yeah, so just to say hello. sure no problem hello everyone I'm good to see many of you again um, so yeah, it was uh, just anecdotally recently we had an RFP come across our desk for another 1990, early 90s uh, middle school, a little bigger than this, 120,000 square feet, which was just addressing infrastructure issues. Its interior looked a lot like this one, pretty nice, um, and had air conditioning in, in the summer. It was great. Uh, they were at 65 million for their project. So just to give you a ballpark that some towns and cities do choose to pursue this kind of work as one big project because it, it helps phasing because you're gonna be doing this work while you're operating the school. Uh, other towns and cities pick off pieces and that's probably more what you're, what you're used to and thinking about. So you can, you can take the roof, maybe that's two to three million dollars and, and do the roof and the skylight replacement as one project, but then you've got the sprinklers to do as well. Putting in sprinklers has a cost, but then there's also the impact on the ceilings. And so you start to think about how you do these projects uh, in a cost-effective way. And, and there's a tendency for these projects to trigger other projects. There's a uh, assessed value of this building is $6.9 million. If any of the projects exceed 30% of that, which we're talking about numbers which are right there, uh, then you have to look at a full accessibility upgrade for ADA as part of that project. So now you're looking at the restrooms, the clearances at the toilets, getting them to work for current codes because the project value is over 30% of the assessed value of the building. Something to think about. Another way to think about this is just to think about your, your roof in general right now. It's working great today, right? They've patched it a couple times. It's, it's holding up, you probably get a couple more years, but it's at the end of its serviceable lifetime. It's been on the building for 20 years or so, uh, and it's gonna keep leaking more and more over time. These patches are only a stopgap measure. Your maintenance department is doing a great job keeping the building from sustaining other damage from those leaks, but it's something that needs to be addressed. I think we can all understand that. Uh, there are other components in the building that are at the end of their serviceable lifetime. They may be working just fine today, no problem, but they're not going to go another 20 years, which is really what we, we want to be thinking about. You know, what's the plan for a while here? We're not trying to make it just three or five years, which we probably could do in this building without too much trouble. So the number of systems at the end of their serviceable lifetime is substantial, and um, some of those are coming up right away. You have eight air handler units in this building which are providing you air. Um, we didn't see any of them on the tour. They're, they're buried in there. But they're all 25 year units which are past their lifetime. So you're gonna be looking for parts for those. You're gonna to have to replace a lot of those going forward. Uh, in the classrooms, you saw the little rectangular boxes, the univents, uh, that's what we call them. They're pulling in air from the outside through vents in the exterior wall conditioning it, putting it into the classroom, uh, and they're recirculating air as well. 
Um, those we don't put into schools anymore, so that becomes a, a problem as those start to go down because they're also at the end of their lifetime. Do you continue to replace them in kind? The reason we don't put them in is because they're loud, so they don't meet current acoustic standards, and because of indoor air quality concerns. They don't provide as good in indoor air quality. You have to be really on top of the filter changes with those for them to continue to work. Uh, so our estimate includes just replacing the whole mechanical system because now you've got the two major components, the air handler unit and the uh, unit vent. And replacing them in kind is going to cost a lot. You might as well just do the whole system. What's a lot? A lot, like? What's a lot? Uh, let's see. For the air handler units, uh, oh, I don't have that broken down. <laughs> well, uh, sorry. Uh, I think we had two or three million on the air handler units, and then the Univents, if you're just replacing them, and I guess I don't have a number for that, I'm sorry, because we looked at it as a full replacement. But the whole mechanical system replacement is 11 million, and then on top of that, you have steel that supports the, the revised air handler units, so you're going to be paying for something. I feel like you're going to have a kind of well. meeting. And I feel like, like you knew you were coming here to discuss this late. Maintenance doing just this, maintenance doing just this for now. You should have had the list of what it would cost for specific maintenance to keep the school going. I have the list, but not for items that aren't part of the estimate. Understand? So everything's, so, everything's separate. Yes, no, so no, you should I, have had we, were, we weren't planning to replace the Univents. We planning to put in a new mechanical system. But you knew coming tonight you were. Right, I brought okay, the list. So you didn't have the information. I brought a lot of information, but not the not specific enough. question that you're asking. That's true. I, no. I couldn't anticipate it exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry, but no big deal. Um, you have fluorescent lights throughout weird. the building. You really need to go to LED lights. So there's a cost there to upgrade the lighting system. Your fire alarm system is again at the end of its serviceable lifetime, it needs to be addressed. The superintendent mentioned a number of electrical upgrades, and so these would fall in that category as well. Um, with the other thing we, we hit on was the security to the building is lacking right now. Your entrance, people can come right into the school. So we included in our estimate uh, the cost to reconfigure the front of entrance to the school. Um, so that, that would be another part of that project, as well as addressing the carpeting and some of the other issues that we saw on the walkthrough. There's other interior finishes that need work. Uh, I will say one thing that our $45 million estimate didn't include, because at the time it wasn't identified as part of the plan, was the reconfiguration that you need to do to bring restrooms to those pre-K classrooms that are operating this year without them, uh, and, and uh, some of the other partition-related requirements for, for the current program. So. We, we had an estimate of what this building would require just to continue its status quo. Now you've changed to a specific program and there would be some costs associated with that. So um, I think I've done my presentation on the subject there. Can we continue on? Yeah. There's a question, yeah. and then they have to have questions. So if you use yeah. all the time, the lowest being handed the presentation, yeah. Beginning. That's right. Yes. I have the beginning. So this project started uh, officially when the statement of interest, the document submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, was approved by their board to be screened into the pipeline for a project. That was in December of 2019. Now, that was my fourth, I'm sorry, my, my personal third submission of a statement of interest on Greylock Elementary School. Prior to that, there had been submitted a statement of interest back in 2010, and this pro that project was considered along with the then Sullivan School, which ultimately became the Conti conversion to Cobro Park Elementary School. So when I first 
became superintendent in 2016, then Mayor Olkenbright said, whatever you do, don't forget about the Greylock community. Make sure that you're submitting that statement of interest for that school. So we continued to submit in December of 2019, it got screened in, which meant that we entered into the eligibility phase. In the eligibility phase, we uh, engaged stakeholders to be part of the school building committee. Uh, as part of their meetings, we entered into um, a stakeholder uh, community uh, effort in creating our education vision and plan. And then we moved forward into, once we knew what the elements were of our education vision, we moved forward into developing the, identifying the design team. So, um, uh, Jesse will speak to the timeline a little bit more in the presentation. Does this work? Well, it's pointed this way, it should work. What, if what if it doesn't, testing? I can click it. Yeah, press it. Okay, okay. advance me. <laughs> so, our school building committee members. Um, you can see that there's a broad range here of individuals representing um, school committee, uh, school administration, school department employees, as well as uh, city council, community members, um, and then uh, some other members uh, that uh, can inform the project but don't are considered non-voting members. Next slide. Our owner's project manager, Tim Alex and Alan Minkus come from Colliers, um, and they, are, they really help us with submission of our invoices uh, to the MSBA so that we're, we have an ongoing reimbursement process, uh, as well as ensuring that we keep to the MSBA timeline so that we keep moving the project forward according to the modules as outlined by the MSBA. TSK studio includes Randall Luther, Julia McFadden, who was really instrumental in helping us identify our education vision and plan, as well as Jesse Saylor. Next slide. And so, do you want to speak with us, Jesse? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, just to say that the process to get here has taken years, as, as the superintendent was just alluding to, and it's been very public. Uh, as she mentioned, it began in 2019 with the submission of the SOI to the MSBA, uh, which then once we were accepted, uh, there were educational visioning meetings uh, that occurred, um, there was maybe four or five of them, um, and occurred over the course of two months, and it involved uh, members of the public, uh, parents, um, district representatives, staff, administration, uh, and that really set the vision for the project, which is presenting. There have been a number of community outreach meetings uh, and uh, working group meetings that hold in stakeholders in the community, police, fire, uh, thank you. <coughs> Sorry, no, I'm glad you let me know. Um, and also um, a number of public uh, committees have reviewed the project. The school committee and the building committee uh, have taken votes, public votes, uh, in support of school council. Thank you. And city council as well, um, in, in favor of going to grade span schools, and then in favor of the preferred option, which we'll uh, show you today. Um, and then um, leading up to the MSBA board, uh, which uh, decided in June of this year to approve $42 million in funding for the project. So that brings us up to today. Obviously. So one of the first things that we had to do as part of our eligibility phase was to work with the Mass School Building Authority in creating an enrollment um, study so that we could, in, because that determines how much they will pay in terms of the square footage of the building. So they need to understand how, what is your level of need based on projected enrollment and then how will you um, address that uh, with in terms of the design of the building itself. So uh, this uses a variety of data. It uses data from the United States Census. It uses data from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Department of Public Health, um, and uh, 
uses that data in their calculation <laughs> in order to create a projection. And so next slide. The, the projection uses 20 years of prior data to then create a projection that goes into the next 10 years. So when we did the eligibility phase of this project, that was in 2020, 2021. So this report came out in 2021. What's not shaded in yellow is the previous 20 years. And then what's shaded in yellow is the next 10 years. And so that ends up determining a number of an enrollment projection that determines the square footage of the project. So overall, yes, our enrollment does have a decline. We have a declining pop projected declining population, projected declining enrollment. But what the MSBA did was pull out looking at our K through six population versus our seven through 12 population. And that's represented by the green and red lines. The red line represents our K6 population. So our K6 population actually starts to slow down and level off, whereas our secondary population does have a much more steeper decline. Next slide. I don't expect you to look at all this data from here. It is on our website, so you can take a look at it. Um, however, this is the actual projection numbers. So what becomes important is down in this corner over here is a pre-K through six number. And that's the number that they project will be the enrollment of our students attending in grades K through six. So that number is 625 students. The issue with 625 students is that we also are the largest pre-K provider in Berkshire County. So there are some seats for enrollment that isn't included in that number. So just above that, you see a number that says available seats outside of the projected school because MSBA thinks K-12. They needed to include pre-K. So with pre-K, it's actually 716 students. Now this school, in 2017, the school committee authorized a report through NESDEC to look at our building capacities. This school, Brayton, was built to house 449 students. 716 is more. Right? So they're not all going to fit in here. Cole Grove, which was a renovation project that was completed in 2016, was renovated and has a capacity of 420 students. Again, the number of students projected to reside in our elementary level exceeds the capacities of either of those buildings. So the question became, we're going to need two schools for elementary grades. Then it, that kind of developed our options to, for consideration, right? And that could include renovation at Greylock, new build at Greylock, renovation at Brayton, right? New build at Brayton. So those are all of the options. Next slide. When you're talking about the pre-game numbers that they came in re-evaluated, and you're allowing for the outside slots for every pre-game student, you're including drawing child care to Berkshire? No. And had to <coughs> No, just the students that we service in North Adams Public Schools, which is on average anywhere from 90 to 100 students. If you take the difference between 716 and 625, it's 91. So that's where it accounts for that is our pre-K numbers. And I can't see that bell. Does it go to, did you say to 2020? So 2030. So, oh, the, so projection the, 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 the projection goes to 2030, but when we were doing the study with the MSBA, they want 20 years back to 2000. Up to 2020, you said. Right, that's where they had real data, and then they use a formula to create a projection for each year after that for the next 10 years out. 
because they're assuming that your project is going to take about 10 years to from beginning eligibility 2019 to completion. Seven years is that. Actual students, correct. Projected from 2020 to 2020. projection while you're doing. This isn't actual fact, numbers and facts. That's projection whatever way you. There's, it's a projection. Right. That doesn't mean it's not a fact, right? Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> but it we don't doesn't know mean it is either. But I can tell you what one fact is. If you look, I have to. We did the renovation at Ray Rock. You can go back to 2005, North Adams has not increased population since 2005. 2016, that renovation was done. We can go up not now one here, here, not one person. So you're saying Cold Grove, you, you said Grove. 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 Okay. Okay. So I, if we can project all we want. Really right, but that, that population, <laughs> population studies are looking at everybody. Right, all of us, we're in that population, right? Yeah. The MSBA is now bringing it down to school age children. They look at birth rates, death rates, right? They're looking at who is it's attending our schools. Two decades without the population changing. What makes them think that? That that was a thirty some million dollar renovation. It did nothing for the population. But they, but they're also showing that this pop that this projection is going down. I'm gonna go because I want to honor okay. people's time, okay? So so the Greylock School project, project, we had to develop an education plan. With that was an education vision. And so we had a group of stakeholders come together that included teachers, uh, community members, uh, pretty much we put it out there. Anybody who wanted to be part of these meetings could be part of these meetings. It happened to be during the pandemic. And so we um, did it remotely, but the facilitator that was hired through TSKP did a really great job in getting us to really think about the future of education and what we were hoping for. Next slide. And so some of the key educational priorities include universal design for learning. Universal design for learning uh, includes looking at how we can create the classroom environment so that all students can benefit. So if a student has a hearing loss, then we're going to look at the design of that classroom acoustically so that all of the students have better access to the material being presented. Um, same could be for visual aids, it could be for chairs, um, using uh, you know ergonomic and uh, uh, appropriate chairs. Uh, somebody asked me a question about a, a different kind of chair that we had upstairs that's used uh, as a sensory chair. Those kinds of things would be inclus included in universal design. Social emotional learning and supports. Um, a lot of our students uh, have a need for um, supports both in the classroom and additional supports. We have a school adjustment counselor at every age level. Some, in some cases, we've added school adjustment counselors. In 1997, under IDEA, all students now have access to a public education. And so we need to make sure that we have spaces that allow for students to have their social and emotional learning needs met. Um, curriculum alignment, we wanted to really think about early elementary grades being about skill development, upper elementary grades being about application and higher order thinking skills, and then really looking at college and career readiness as they enter secondary school in that trajectory towards graduation. Emphasis on engaging instructional practices, you'll see the acronym STEAM there, that includes science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. And so using an engaging approach to instruction, robust access and use of technology, it is the way of the future, and so buildings that will build to be concrete um, industrial types of buildings are retrofitted for today's modern technology. And if some of you are trying to use your cell phone, you may find that you don't have access in here. Um, or in the hallway, you have to wait till you get close to a window. 
Um, and inclusion and support for in-district special education programming. Um, because we have students with a higher level of need coming into our school, Brayton has always been the home to our steeples program um, under grade configuration. It will also house our castles program, which services students who are on the autism spectrum, as well as students who have a known social and emotional disability. That was seen as a priority from the community um, when developing the education plan. So those were the educational priorities they wanted us to focus on as we go went about developing the architectural priorities and thinking about how do we access outdoor space and have a seamless transition to the outside world. Natural light came up as very important. We do know now, studies have shown, that access to natural light is very good for social emotional health as well as for academic outcomes. Um, efficient and effective design, flexible, elegant, simple, and uh, collaboration spaces, not just for our students, but for our staff, so that we're, they're able to work collaboratively in developing high quality lesson plans for, to, for our students, as well as having confidential meeting spaces. Um, because when our students have a personal need that needs to be addressed by a school adjustment counselor or a teaching assistant or a staff member, they, under FERPA, under HIPAA, they, they need to have a confidential space to do that. So these were identified in that education plan as priorities for consideration as we went, entered into the design phase. And then I get to pass it back over to Mr. Sandler. Thank you, all right, so we're gonna present the project and how it meets uh, the educational plan that was developed and some of those architectural priorities that the superintendent was just going through. Oh, can I add one thing? Of course. Uh, I wanna commend the people who were on our task force that developed the education plan because it needed to be presented to the MSBA and approved by the board. And they felt that the group had done such an amazing job in developing that education plan and vision that they wanted to use it as a model for other districts. So a lot of people in this room were part of that process, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, it was such a great Thank you. Um, so first I'd like to talk about site security because it's really an organizing principle to the site layout that you see in this 3D view. Um, First, you'll notice that the playground areas are pulled away from vehicular areas and tucked to the sides of the building. Um, vehicular areas then are organized into different types of use, which is important. We have the bus loop on the far right side so that buses are not mixing in with cars and cars drop off uh, in front of the building uh, on the left side, just uh, encircling the parking area. Uh, and that's definitely a safety goal that we look for to manage traffic on site. The administration offices are located just inside the main entrance on the right side of it there, which gives them great passive surveillance, great views of anyone approaching the site from, from the parking area, uh, which is ideal, that's what we look for. And then lastly, I'll mention that the service area, you can't see here, right? It's on the back side of the building. It's, it's taken away from you, it's taken away from students and from the public in general uh, to keep those larger trucks and other vehicles away, which is also good for safety in, uh, in an elementary school. The next slide, please. Um, here's the site plan. It's kind of the same information, but looking down on the drawing. And I'll highlight the way that the site plan makes opportunities for education to use the uh, outdoor environment to learn about nature. Uh, the site plan includes uh, an explorer's courtyard, uh, raised planter beds, uh, those protected playground areas I just mentioned. It includes a multi-use field for, um, for gym class, uh, which is just in front of the building on the right side. Uh, and then one of the unique features about this site is that um, it has the Appalachian Trail running, running by it on Phelps Ave. I can't think of another school that has that opportunity. So there's another educational opportunity to learn about the environment for our, for our students. Um, or on a community side, 
uh, and also regarding that Appalachian Trail. The project includes relocating the existing kiosk, which is on the school property, uh, and, and improving it uh, and, and giving it, it's just at the bottom of the plan there. You can hardly read it tonight, but uh, you can see can you, the, can you point to the yeah, yeah, I can. Can you a lot of questions? Because I read it down down. Yeah, right in here. So it, it's currently here. It's going to move here. Um, you notice there's this big lawn area around it. So there's a good amount of space, but it has a little bit of distance from the school, which the school administration felt was important because you don't 100% know that, that hiking population. Um, it could be anyone coming through that way. Um, but it has good space to spread out. It's very much the same kind of grassy area that it has right now. And it will be a discussion with members of the community as to how we develop that kiosk in, in, in a way that works best. Could you point out where the pre-K uh, playground is and the K-2 playground? Because that was part of the consideration when we met with the safety committee, was moving the kiosk away from playground areas where their children may have access during the day. Right, yeah, you have a good point, Mr. Kim. Thank you. The current location is actually right at the service drive here, you wouldn't want to keep it there. And, and in addition, you have the pre-K kindergarten play area here, uh, you know, with the school essentially being built adjacent to the existing location, which is here, it ends up quite close to that existing kiosk location. So there's this sort of flip-flop. The school's moved this way, the kiosk is moved this way. Uh, so I think it's covered that. Um, good. Um, another community amenity is the parking lot. The Alcan Wright athletic fields are adjacent to the site just to the right here, just off the page. Uh, and so the expanded parking serves the community in terms of using those fields. And then included in the project is a basketball and pickleball courts as an ad alternate. So that's another community amenity. Those aren't really for the school use. Next slide. Here's a view of the building, uh, really the main entrance of the building. And you can see that with the relocation of the building, the flip-flop I was just mentioning, now the entrance faces to the south, which is beneficial. It brings in warm light. Uh, from, you're going to have sunlight in the winter in the main entrance, which is great. We have overhanging roof. Uh, we see this area right in front of the building, which is sheltered by that overhanging roof as a community porch. Uh, we've lined it with warm, inviting materials and we we're calling it community porch because we're thinking this is a space where you'll want to talk with your neighbor you'll want to uh, impromptu meet someone and have a comfortable space to catch up uh, and so that's the idea there Thanks. sorry uh, and then as you enter the building you go through the uh, general office and sign in and then you enter the lobby which is, which is this image. Uh, we think of the lobby as a kind of extension of the community porch. Um, this is where your visitors are likely going to be waiting. Uh, and they receive information about what's going on in the school. We have display cases showing student work. We have digital signage, which talks about the programming of the school. And visually, it's an interesting space. It has daylight and it's able to connect the two uh, floors of the school. Next slide, please. Here's the first floor plan. Uh, if you look at the red spaces in the floor plan, uh, right here, these are your community access spaces. Uh, your gymnasium is often a community amenity. The cafeteria typically gets used. Here we are in the cafeteria tonight. We've got the music room, the media center, uh, these larger spaces that the community might use. They're right near the main entrance, and they're able to be um, divided from the academic areas. That means that when you let the community into the cafeteria, you don't have to be worried about them going back into the classroom wing. The building allows you to partition it, which is a goal. Uh, that way you get a better secure building the next day when you go to open up. You know people haven't been in the classroom wing. Or in my town at basketball practice, the kids are running through the halls. Do you ever have that problem? Um, but anyways, um, another consideration in this plan is the organization of the pre-K and kindergarten classrooms into what we call classroom neighborhoods. 
So you see these are the orange and yellow spaces here. Uh, and this is a planning idea in which all the general classrooms plus the support spaces, uh, both the special services, uh, the breakout spaces uh, in the corridor, um, storage spaces, uh, and, and of course, well, the restrooms are in each classroom here. But they're all organized into um, a neighborhood. Uh, and then those neighborhoods have access to the, to the courtyard, the explorer's courtyard, and the play area, which is just adjacent, and the outdoor classroom. Um, so we conceived of it that way. Um, I will say that the plan is, is compact and simple, but it achieves the adjacencies that were ideal as identified in the educational plan that Barbara was talking about. Okay, so here's a view in the um, cafeteria, which you can see on the right side. The cafeteria receives daylight from skylights up above, uh, so it's a bright space. And that light also penetrates into the corridors which ring it on the first and second floor. Uh, on the left side of this view, you can see the media center. The media center has, um, has these playful window cutouts, uh, which uh, are, are available for students to find a book and find an interesting seat. Uh, also, it has this um, full height window a little bit further down the corridor, which looks into the creativity lab. The Creativity Lab is a STEAM space. Um, the superintendent was talking about the importance of STEAM in our programming. Um, this is the space where you can, you can do craft projects. You have a uh, sink and the ability to do wet materials if necessary. And so we put it in a, in a location where uh, it's also very visible to, to people entering the building because we, we think those projects are interesting and it will encourage collaboration, uh, different people's involvement. How many stairs are going up there for these little little kids? How many stairs do we have to climb? It's just a it's a two story building, and so you have first and second grade on the second floor. It's a standard number of stairs for a one to, for a story. The ceilings are high, so it's not. Can we do questions after, please? So I just want to get through the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. It, it is a standard floor to floor height, very similar to this building. Um, Okay, into the gymnasium. Um, this is uh, another space that's available for the community, like the cafeteria. It has a regulation sized basketball court for that reason. It also has bleacher seating for 200. Um, as the school's using it, it's able to be subdivided through a curtain into multiple teaching spaces. And it's located intentionally with windows that look out to the, uh, to the multi use field. Uh, we want to encourage gym activities to, to take advantage of that field, go outside, so it's, it's right there, it's adjacent. If you have some equipment to bring, it's not a problem. Here's a view of the kindergarten neighborhood uh, in the corridor, and you see that the corridor widens up at the courtyard, uh, and that creates a, what we call a breakout space. This is a space in the corridor that's defined for, for small groups to, to learn, um, this is an alternative. Sometimes you see students pushed out from the corridor. This is one of the alternatives in, 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 this, in this project, recognizing that sometimes you do need to get out of the classroom. Um, and this is a, one way to do that. If you go to the next slide. Uh, we've now looked through the windows into the courtyard. Uh, one of the features here that I want to mention is the the turtles that were living or have been living in the Greylock School courtyard are, are going to be relocated to the new Greylock School, which is kind of a fun, kind of a fun feature. Um, so we're, we're proposing a turtle habitat, which you kind of see in the bottom right. Um, but also, this courtyard is adjacent to a lot of important spaces. It's, a, it's adjacent to the pre-kindergarten and kindergarten uh, neighborhoods. It's also adjacent to the media center and the um, music room so that the first and second graders who are using those spaces will have access to the courtyard. So the whole school really benefits from this courtyard as its vision. Up to the second floor plan, um, it's, it's a pretty simple floor plan. You have first and second grade uh, wrapping around the cafeteria and gymnasium, which are taller spaces. Um, and uh, I'll just mention that the classrooms at, and the second floor are organized in pairs. 
Uh, and each uh, pair is provided with a small group construction room uh, that's, that's between the two rooms and is shared by them. And the small group construction room then has some windows um, so that the teacher who's probably in the general classroom can see what the small group of students are doing in the small group construction room. So this creates another alternative to sending students out into the corridor where, where they may get distracted or lost. Uh, the teacher can send a group of three or four in, into this room, be able to monitor them, but not be subject to the noise they might be making as they work on a project. And it's recognition that there needs to be some acoustical separation within the class, classroom environment in order to make zones uh, that's, that's built into the building. Um, also on the second floor, we have a, another corridor breakout space. Uh, we made a rendering of this one uh, because it has such great natural light. The other one did too, um, but this one has the, the view to the mountain and the, and the self-facing view is something that this, this building takes advantage of in many locations. Many of the rooms have this kind of view. So. Um, here's our last visualization. It's a view uh, from Phelps Avenue. Uh, so this is your approach as you approach the building. Uh, you can see that the single story pre-kindergarten and kindergarten wing faces Phelps Avenue. That was something we intentionally did to have this, the lower part of the school, the smaller scale part, um, face Phelps and have uh, more of a contextual connection with the single family, smaller scale houses along Phelps Ave. Uh, also the sloping roof uh, evokes the gable roofs that we have often along Phelps Ave. So I hope you've seen that the building we proposed is, is relatively compact. It's, it's a simple building. Um, and, and in that, it, it's also efficient. And so we have some, uh, we have two items here to talk about in terms of efficiency. One is energy efficiency. Um, the building will uh, save the, the city of North Adams money that's currently being spent on utilities uh, for the Greylock School. Uh, it saves $110,000 per year, uh, which over 30 years equals $3.3 million. This is a savings that we haven't factored into all the other money calculations that are coming up later, but it's something for you to consider that taking that Greylock school offline and going with a more efficient new school will save you money in terms of operations. Next. Also, um, it's compact building, which relates to cost efficiency as well. Um, and uh, this slide shows the nine elementary schools which are in the MSBA pipeline right now with construction starts in 2025. Uh, the reason we look at the same year is because the cost of the value of money keeps changing with escalation uh, and all of these projects have a similar time so they have a similar cost. And you can see that the North Adams Greylock project is the least expensive cost per square foot of all the projects. So you know, we like to think of it as a good value for the city because we're, we're able to provide a school uh, which is doing all the things that I just mentioned, meeting the educational plan goals, but it also doesn't cost a lot. It's, it's on the lower end of schools in the MSBA pipeline. Um, here we have the cost of the project. The, here we're at those numbers. Um, first, the total cost of the project is $65.4 million. Um, and the state share is $42.2 million, uh, and another $3.6 million come from energy incentives from the federal and from the local, uh, from the state utility. Uh, that leaves a uh, share for North Adams just under $20 million at $19.6 million. Uh, so 30% of the cost of the project falls to the city. Um, this slide shows the cost. If, if we choose to not build a new building and continue on with the break in school. And as I was mentioning earlier, um, keep in mind that we're talking about uh, a certain period of time using this school, 10 or 20 years, uh, we expect that projects are going to be required to keep the school going. I mentioned them earlier, I'll, I'll just touch on it briefly now. We've got the roof, we've got the mechanical system issues, We've got the accessibility issues. Uh, we've got um, the 
Um, the sprinklers, we've got the uh, pavement outside and needs to be repaved. There's a number of exterior items. The windows are at the end of their serviceable life. I'll stop. We, we can go through the whole list. Of but I should point out this that. This is available on the district website. That's, it's available on the district website. Thank you. I didn't realize that. And I should point out that the difference about these two costs uh, is that all of the costs to, that you'd be required to pay to maintain this building are, are going to be seen as maintenance by the MSBA. And so it all falls onto the city. And that's, that's something to consider. Next slide, please. Um, and then, of course, um, there are some aspects of this building that are layout related. And so even though we're, we're addressing maintenance related things, we can fix the roof, no problem. It's hard to add windows to some of those spaces that are backed up against the, the formerly known as Y. Uh, what do we call it? Not the recreation center. Thank you, recreation center, right. Um, so that's one of the issues, just going ahead of this building. Um, the high cost of energy use, um, that could be addressed by the mechanical systems, it, it depends. The vertical circulation over three stories, that's a tough one. And we've got our kindergarten and pre-K on the third floor. Um, they got to go up and down the stairs. It's, it's just not ideal, um, but it'll work for a while. Uh, and then the lack of site safety and circulation issues. It is, it is really hard if you see this building uh, operate uh, when, when you have parents coming to drop off and the bus is in the bus queue. Uh, everyone's coming up that hill, and it's a, it's an orchestrated drop off the way they do it now. It, it works, but it's it's not great uh, for safety. Um, so um, this is the summary, um, the schedule. Um, if if the funding is approved at the vote uh, in October, I should say, um, then uh, the building will be ready to open um, in September of 2027. Uh, approximately three years uh, and uh, so that's that's one path and the other path if it's not approved and, and you want to do a project with the MSBA um, you fall out of the MSBA pipeline if it's not approved and you're really looking at seven to ten years to get back to this point if you're going to do another project with the MSBA so it really is a pretty good duration if, if it goes that path uh, all right that was our presentation are we open for questions? We are, are going to open for questions. But first, Madam Mayor, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for coming tonight. If you can't hear me, I'm sorry. I'm struggling with my voice today. Uh, so first of all, thank you for coming and in investing your interest in this project. Um, we are very excited about this project and how it can um, really help us with our educational program as we move forward. So it's not really about us. It's about our children, which I've described several times as our best asset as we move forward um, to sustaining our community. Um, I know to some, I'll never convince you that this is a great project, but I personally, professionally, believe that this is the best project that we can put forward. Um, the MSBA has been very diligent with us about um, this process, and it's not something that this team just concocted in our heads, as the superintendent mentioned, there are many, many people um, on the, the uh, school building committee who invested a lot of time and effort, and they should be praised for their work um, as well. But it's really important that we think not about today, not about this administration. Um, we think about the future of our kids. And this is one project that we can feel and touch and see and see it grow. Um, so I'm excited about this project. I'm encouraged about this project. I think it's the best option we have for our children as we move forward. So the next couple of years, you know, it's going to be a little rough as we navigate this building, um, but we're doing everything possible to make this building alive and a good educational facility. But the truth is, it's outgrown its life as well as Greylock. Uh, one thing that we were excited about was the praise that we got through deciding about grade span school. So, you know, somebody said, you know, we're, you're closing a building because you went to great span schools. Well, first and foremost, we're closing a building because it's out seen its life. And secondly, because of our population. And with that, devil's advocate would say, well, yeah, you've got a declining population. We've got a shrinkage of students, but yet you're proposing a new school. Conceptually, we have to prepare for what we have 
and to have room for the future. We cannot fit all of our pre-K to six students in one building. Um, and to provide the educational vision that we've spent a lot of time on um, in this community, the pre-K to two option, grade span three to six, and seven to 12, is what we feel is the best in the best interest of the community. Um, I know that there's some people that will never gonna change their mind, um, and I respectfully accept that, as I hope you will too, but this is about the children. This is about the future of North Adams and uh, making sure that they get the best education like a lot of us did in this room. So that's my quick two cents, but we'll open it up for questions. Yes? So if, you don't, if you don't mind saying your name, sure. so we have to follow up with you on something we have it on record. Sure, uh, my name's Alex Mason. Um, from the way you guys show the difference between maintenance on this school, building the new school, kind of shows that it's going to be more expensive to, in the long run, maintenance of this school. Do we have a number of people's concerns are property taxes going up as a result of this? Do we have a number of, in the long run, how much more individuals' taxes would go up if we keep this school in maintenance because we're paying double the price? And yeah, we didn't run a number on what the impact would be of the 45 million. We ran a number on the, that's a good question though, of the impact. We would never be able to renovate this building on our own. It would have to be piecemeal. So uh, ultimately that would be budgeted through the school budget and it would impact, but we, we didn't run the particulars piece by piece. Uh, we certainly couldn't undertake a whole 45 million at once. Um, and then we also are sensitive to triggering the ADA piece, which is a great concern because the things we have to do in this building are high ticket items. I know Tally, you asked a question about the radiators, um, but we look at the whole global mechanical systems. Um, so what we're focusing on is the $20 million of what would be um, the burden of the taxpayer, so to say. I have a question about the $45 million. Wait, just for, hold, hold on one second. Are you all set? Yeah, so, kind of, but we, 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 it would be fair to say that over the next 20 years, what that's spelling out, an individual's property tax would be higher if the new school was not built. Correct. Correct. Because the work that we do internally is not reimbursed by the MSBA. We are on the hook for 100% of that. Could I yes. ask Jesse to speak to, because if one of the options, because we had to develop a menu of options for the school building committee to then evaluate, um, and if that, that was a very arduous process going through, and eventually we got it down to renovation of Grayton, renovation of Greylock, new building Greylock. So Jesse, do you want to speak to, to because of the, the school, the cost of those three ultimately, if, depending on which one we said to submit to the MSBA, the cost was very, very similar, just because of the way things cost today. So I'm gonna let him speak to it because he's more attuned than I am about it. No problem. What we did, we did look at renovation options to this building as well as Greylock to, to meet the program. And I think that's the key difference. You said, you know, why would it cost more than 45 million? That's already a lot, uh, but to really meet the program, now we have to have it per state law, every classroom is supposed to have a window, right? So we found ways to reconfigure the floor plan layouts, move partitions uh, to bring in daylight to have um, this building be more effective uh, and, and be able to have the classrooms with windows so that um, so that we'd achieve that. That would, that would be one of the major differences that's in that renovation plan as opposed to just like the maintenance plan. Um, and there are a couple other things we were doing in that project like the outdoor play space for this building is really limited actually um, as well as the vehicular circulation is pretty poor. So we were modifying the vehicular circulation, we are also creating play space over here near the cafeteria in that project so that, um, so that you'd have play space. Right now, I think it's just that grass field over there to the right of the entrance that, that the students are using. Uh, unless they're pre-K and K, then they have um, some equipment over there, but it's, it's pretty sparse. Um, so we we're trying to do that as well as part of that to, to get to a certain certain standard of safety in the site um, that we would typically have in, in, a, in a school. Um, so I think I 
those, those were more involved, and so the cost was more. It was about the same as the new building, so when given that choice, the, it was obvious, let's go with the new building, and let's not keep modifying this great school. Maybe there's another use that it would be more appropriate for. There's some natural boundaries as well. We have the river on one side of the property here, and we have the hill. And, and so one of the other considerations that actually impacts cost is the site itself. And so maneuverability around the site, some of the things that Jesse just mentioned. Yes. So, the, so my name is Liz Rutledge Triad. I am So a couple questions about the $45 million number, which is, does, is it coming when we look at that number, is it coming from the architecture firm that would also, and you know, you have a job to do, but you guys stand to benefit from the renovation, right? Because you'd be doing the, the, the I mean, the, from a brand new school, right? So do those numbers come from the architecture firm that would be building the new school, or do those numbers come from kind of outside bid sources? When we talk about the $45 million. Well, we use an independent cost estimator. Uh, so that's one, that's where the estimate comes yeah. from. It's not our estimate. We, go out to work yeah, that's my, question. Um, but my second question is so I, I know that you say it's maintenance for everything I just don't like I'm trying to be the most informed voter I can when I make this choice so when we talk about maintenance costs and how the state won't pay maintenance costs are there no grants available for improvements for changes or is it just a new process like what I don't understand is if the state is willing to pay forty five million dollars for a brand new school are they, is there no funding for safety improvements? We don't have any sprinklers. There's no funding for like HVAC improvements or is that, it's, I just wanna know kind of what, if this doesn't come to pass, what are the options that are in front of us? Well, I, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, the superintendent brought up, the MSBA does have an accelerated repair program. Um, that's for roofs, boilers, and window and doors. Um, but but that once, it. once you go into with a core project, you're you're essentially saying <coughs> that your building isn't isn't um, can't be used in its current state. It's not you're just repairing and extending the life of your current building. Um, that's what the accelerated repair was really for: is to really invest money into a building that is dysfunctional and meets your needs, meets your program. Um, there may be other op opportunities to. Um, to, to, to hunt down grants and uh, and, and different options, uh, not that's not my field. But um, those would be a lot of times. Those come with certain qualifications too, sure. um, that you need to meet certain guidelines and minimums to in order to, to receive that money. And especially if it's federal money, where then it has to be the Amer Buy America, Build America, which there's a certain cost for that or, or other thresholds that you would have to meet. And then in terms of, so we're in a 30-year-old building that absolutely needs improvements. It's very clear it needs improvements and changes no matter what. So if we're talking about building a brand new school, is there a plan in place to future-proof that new school so that we're not here in 30 years having the same exact conversation? Because that's, it's, you know, 30 years is not a long time for a building to be standing. So is there a plan to future-proof this building so that we're not sitting here 30 years talking about how it's all outdated and in 2024 this is what they were doing and now we can't use it? Because I think it's, Clearly, this building needs a lot of changes, so it's not that it doesn't need to change, but do we have a plan? So we have a different philosophy about deferred maintenance than I think we had like 30 years ago. Um, we, uh, I'm looking at Bob because we have the philosophy if we see it, fix it. Um, but what we see in this building is more than we can fix on a daily, weekly, monthly, fiscal program. Um, and. You know, we're very sensitive. I, I know my building crew and, and Bob's team are constantly trying to make it the best that it can. But, you know, we can change the ceiling tiles a hundred times, but I guarantee you probably in two months they're gonna look like that again. Because um, there are things that you just, you need a new roof. Um, so to kind of answer your question, we have a new philosophy on deferred maintenance. Um, it's probably not new to maybe Bob, um, but we do the best we can within our resources, but this is an opportunity for us to kind of really get ahead of the curve and maintain. And that's what Bob's team does. Um, but we have old buildings. We have old buildings. The interesting thing, um, I wanted to go back to your question about grants. Um, so this project will have a lead rating 
Um, we are working very closely for, I think Jesse submitted an application um, to secure some IRA funding for some of the mechanicals to have it um, carbon free. What's the word I'm looking for, Jesse? Uh, uh, I'm sure it's carbon free, but just the, the uh, using the geothermal. The geothermal and, and those kind of things. So we're, we're taking advantage of a lot of those new programs that are rolled, rolling out and we get points from the MSBA for taking advantage of those programs. So we're very sensitive to pulling any money that we can into this project. Um, so what's presented is what we know, what we feel we can grab for. I hope I answered your yeah, question. Yes, absolutely, that's very helpful. I just, the funding, I just wanna make sure I know what I'm actually voting for when I'm voting and not just sort of major responding. One, one point just to emphasize, the, the 44 million was talked about was just maintaining what you have. It's not addressing any of the program issues. So the big picture is that the, with the MSBA reimbursement on a new building, your cost is twice. Not minimizing it, it's a lot of money, but it's you, you're going to be repairing your your program, yeah. making the I building know. fit the well, making the building fit the the program versus making the program fit the building. And the programming stuff is important, but like the building can't actually teach the kids. So I think that I'm that kind of the safety and the maintenance of building is more interesting to me almost than the program at this point because you can put good teachers in a you know okay so I'm, you should but what i'm saying is but i think it's i think it's important to not get lost in the design of the building and I, the design is lovely and i think it would be very nice but i think it's also you know the reality is the building can't teach the kids so I'm trying to think beyond just the program development. Day. Um, two things. One, I'll make that part quick. Like I said before, our, I keep hearing about the numbers and the projections, but these numbers are facts. We go back over almost 20 years without our population budging. So I don't, and we did do a renovation. Am I right, Dick? Well, how much was that one? 30 what? Uh, Lost 32 million. 32 million. Didn't change the population because the numbers are facts. They're not projections. Our population has not gone up. But now you want the residents to pay. And we still owe seven and a half million on that one. Don't forget that when you're voting on this. We owe seven and a half million. They want another almost 20 million on this one. And three for three grades. So I'm just saying, Four. think about it. I'll tell you, the city is as divided on this as it was when Cold World was. That I know, my phone's ringing off the hook, and I'm not getting. So, but I will tell you, I would, one other thing. The pickleball field, didn't you think that that really has nothing to do with the school? It's more a community thing, if I yes. heard you right? Yes. So if it doesn't have anything, you keep saying that this is for the kids. We are an elderly community. We are not a young community. The, little, the young kids won't be using it. You're at $65 million. You couldn't leave that off? Any little bit helps when a community is as broke as the city in North Africa. You're absolutely right. Every, every, little, every little bit helps. Yeah. But this is going to be a community facility, and you're right, we do have an elderly population, but there also is a demand for more pickleball courts. You cannot believe the amount of people in this community who play pickleball. And everybody laughs about it, but it's true. And we want to enhance this property to the maximize the whole community because the whole community is paying the increase whether if you have kids or not that's for so, well they I really are the whole but then, community is um, not paying as i mentioned in the presentation that was pretty quiet um, it's an alternate the pickleball court so it's available if we have the money when we go to bids you said when you go to bid it sometimes comes in a little bit lower than you were planning we might be able to use that money and get the pickleball court or to but, get rid of it and leave it so it's cheaper. I, I point that out to say that little we, weak field. we realized that wasn't key to the program. It's not key to the kids. But it's like a nice to have. 
So that's. I get it. There's a lot of nice things, but I'm just saying when you're asking people for a $65 million school, and like I said, we haven't paid off Cold Grove. And it didn't change it. It's a $65 million school that we're going to pay approximately $20 million for. So but we're all right. We're still paying for the last school. Right. It, agreed. I can't, I'm not going to disagree with you on yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Mrs. Um, my question was about enrollment and the projections that you have. You're looking at it as a steady state. Is there capacity in the schools that you're planning to? Sorry. Are you in the projections for enrollment? It's kind of a steady state, is what you're looking at. Do you have an opportunity in the schools the way they're designed for an increased enrollment? Will you have room for more students for, say, if St. Stan's isn't able to sustain or something in the Berkshire Hills, whatever your union is, John? If something changed, I mean, we already partner with um, we already partner with Stanford and Reedsboro for high school. What if those communities said we can't support our elementary and younger children anymore and they look to North Adams? Is there capacity in this plan to accommodate that? So, so understand that this is not my projection. This came to us from the MSBA. I understand that. That's so, what I'm saying. It's like, is the facility that you're planning to that projection or is it flexible enough well, to allow for an increase if that were you know if it, if it brings more people it does include the projection includes all resident children whether they attend north adams public schools or not so that way if something were to happen there is that capacity for us to absorb the students who might come from a private school that you know suddenly has to close its doors or something like that 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 is considered part of the projection that they do in their calculation um but i don't know what those like i couldn't tell you exactly what those numbers are for each year um but that's why you know they are looking at a trend projection and saying yes you know for for the resident children of North Adams, this is where we're at. And, and they look at choice in and out and all of that. And is there flexibility in your design to accommodate that? Like you, you Dr. Can we put the, this visual up, which shows the top right? So if you look at the top right, there's the dotted dash red line. That's opportunity for additional expansion on the land. So within the actual structure itself, the classrooms, do have some additional capacity for increased students, but if we were to get an influx, there's also space in the planning to build an add-on that wouldn't be a trailer, it would be part of the building itself. It would be an additional cost, but that would be something that would be needed if we had an influx of new students. We have a, right now, if we went by the 2017 NESDAQ report, where we have excess capacity is at the high school. The high school is, is a very large facility some people in here graduated remember the graduation classes of, of Drury High School from the past. So there is a, there is some excess capacity at the high school as well. Right. Um, I think you said, correct me if I'm wrong, that this facility would be fine for three to five years without anything being completed to it. So I, I just want to verify that. And my, my question actually is, what are you going to do with Brayton once the students are moved out? What is going to happen to this building? Why don't you answer the first sure. and then I'll answer the second part. Uh, my intent was more to say that the $45 million won't come to bear in the next three to five years. Uh, but I, I don't know what's going to break tomorrow. Uh, so you may encounter some of those costs sooner than anyone anticipates. Um, and it's just a matter of how things go with some of these systems that are at the end of their serviceable life. So I, I was just saying the entire thing is that I'm likely to break down. Yeah. No, I, and if I could answer just one part that I could tell you was really something we considered as part of this year's budget process was the roof here, the cost of the roof here. That That is going to happen sooner than later. Um, because as I said, we've been able to patch, and, and Bob has done a great job patching, but we're really at that point where it's now becoming difficult to differentiate between patch and roof. And that creates a weakness 
in itself, every you know, all that patching. So so roof the roof project will come before that that may have to happen sooner than later. Okay. Uh, it was actually something we actually had uh, discussed with the mayor for this year's budget process. We were able to patch, we were able to so that we could move forward with other capital improvement projects that we already had in, in the pipeline. But I would say, I would be very shocked, so let's put it this way, I'd be very shocked if Bob didn't sit down with me at budget time and say, it's time, you need a roof at break. No, that's right here. I, I, if we need a roof, you gotta put it on the roof. Um, so this as far as you know, the future of this building, of course we're gonna have a new roof. We, we use, your question is about we use the reuse yep. of the building. Yeah. So in our crystal ball, because we don't know how long a project will take. I mean, we're we're saying 2027, but in the crystal ball, um, we are exploring and talking internally about different educational options that could come in here, whether they be our sub programs, our administrative office. We also, because we know that there is a need for more housing in North Adams, could we use the bottom part for something in commercial condo up the top? I, we're not there yet, but we're not going to let the building sit. And then there's the long-term question, are we going to keep the building? Um, our hope is that we can reuse this in some kind of educational hub, not only for us, but other entities within our community or surrounding community and get some rental income. Um, we also are hopeful, we, you know, as we talk more about affordable housing and um, the need for more housing in North Adams, is that an option? Could we have it for multi-use? Um, so we don't want it to sit here like Solomon's School. Are you all set? I just want to make, are you all set for me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Jen? Following that line, yeah. <laughs> if we were to, it, the tentative date of 2027, turn this into educational options or leasing options, would this building not still need $45 million in repairs of windows and doors and carpet? <coughs> it would still need to be renovated of some kind. And how would we pay the, for that if right. we're already in the separate space? Right, the question is, do we sublease things and we have people come in and make those renovations um, to some of the things that are within the building? I mean, we're always probably responsible. We are responsible for all the envelopes, the roofs, the windows, the doors, those kind of things. Um, but that that's a crystal ball thing. We're not quite there yet. Um, but we know from our experience at Sullivan that we can't have empty buildings. It's just disastrous. All right, as a follow-up then, could you share with me, I Berkshire's did a um, quote from one of the committee members, I believe it was committee member Liam, I can't, I'm not positive, that uh, regardless of how this came down, that the um, Braden had areas that was going to be need immediate investment, but then it referred us to the school's website, which did not identify what those areas are. So what so, would immediate mean, and what would that investment be? So the, the I, mean, I believe that the immediate investment were on the frequently asked questions about the itemized things that we had for HVAC, the roof, the electrical. We have some electrical problems in this building. There was an itemized list, I believe it's in the FAQ, right? Um, that those are our priorities as well. Um, so to answer your question, one isn't more important over the other. <clears throat> However, we are concerned about the long-term longevity of the roof over this building. Okay, so let me just clarify one more thing so I'm gonna be sure I'm understanding. I believe when this gentleman spoke, he said once you open that can of worms and start to fix anything, everything's required to come in compliance. So if we need, as was quoted, repairs here immediately, so does that not leave us on the hook for 45 it, million? It could open, it will open the door if we have to do the roof repair and if we have to do a whole electrical upgrade in here. It does leave us in a very vulnerable position. Some of this is dependent on use. Uh, so if you're looking at the sprinkler system, for example, uh, if this isn't a school, you may not need to have a sprinkler system, right? That's a uh, that's a safety expectation for schools these days, and it's a requirement by law for a new school. Uh, but if, if you're not using it for a school, you may not need it at that cost. So that, another one could be the univents in the classrooms, where I said we wouldn't want to replace with another univent because of the quality issues with indoor air quality. But if it's a different use, it may not be an issue because you don't have young students. 
or maybe I misunderstood you, but I was positive you said if we fix one thing once we start, it opens a can of worms and we have to come in compliance in all areas. You, you so did misunderstand me. Yes, if the project exceeds certain values, then it, it triggers certain things. That, that's the best way I could put it because it is complicated. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned that if the, if the project value exceeds 30% of the assessed value of the building, it requires the accessibility upgrade. That's one of those. Well, that's great to hear then. We're not on the hook for 45 million if we take the time to go ahead and tomorrow. Yeah, I think if you were uh, changing use, you, you may be able to avoid some of that cost, correct? Mr. Compare, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, the 65 million new school. Does that include the demolition of the old school and all the site work? Yes. It does. What's the odds that that project, like a lot of state projects, runs 10 to 15 percent over? Who's on the hook for that? Yeah, there, there are contingencies within that 65 million. Um, they, they cover price escalation, for example, that's been a recent hot topic. Um, and they also cover unknown factors, like in the uh, demolition of the building. There's a, there's a hazardous materials estimate right now uh, that will be actually will be improved before we go to bid. We'll do some destructive investigations, um, but it's also common that when you actually check things down, you find something. So these contingencies are there for things like that. So um, the contingency. Once we enter into that agreement, the MSPA allows us to go to that next stage of design. So we go into the design development, where you take this schematic design and you start to create real documents from it. Um, and then from there, you go back to the state, you go through an estimate, rec uh, send it out to two different estimators, get them together, you do a reconciliation, make sure that you're sticking to that budget that you agreed to. And then you go to construction documents. And so that's where some of the real details start to come together. And you go through another set of estimates, two different estimators. And you get in a room and you estimate and you reconcile those numbers, make sure that you're on budget before you're allowed to then continue into the further in, into the next level. So there's a number of different bars that we have to get to to allow us to move forward. And that's really making sure that we're on target. <coughs> With our estimates and again they're, they're independent estimators um, the OPM will hire one for the for the city the architect hires one we go out to independent estimators we don't do it in-house we, we want to go with people who do this every day who understand the different uh, nature of what's going on within the Commonwealth and different communities and the, the labor pool and the commodities pricing that that's all they do um, this morning I was on a, an estimate reconciliation meeting for, for a different project it's, very detailed, very long. So there are processes in place to try and avoid any kind of surprises at bid. It can happen that you go to bid and the prices come in a little bit higher or a little bit lower. Hopefully that you're close enough that you have contingency that if they come in, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars high, you can take that and still hire your contractor to do the work. But then at least the scope is defined. He has a, an understanding of what he has to do or, or they have to do. Um, if there are some unknowns, um, that's where your contingency would come in. You have a certain percentage of, of dollars that are for those, those unknowns that you might find in construction. Certainly, demolition and construction of a new building, there's a lot less unknowns. Uh, as if you were to renovate a, a building, you open up a, a wall to try and um, do something, you find out that the structure is not what you thought it was. Uh, it's a different ballgame. So, new construction at least it's a little bit more streamlined, straightforward. You, we don't expect to find those kinds of, of costs that get added to it. And, and as you hear that, you know, some projects go way over. That's that's not typically something the MSBA wants to see. So that's why they make us go through these multiple rounds of estimates, reconciliations, and needing approval from them to be able to move forward. Yes. So with the projected new school, is there a breakdown of like when when that roof is going to need replacement and kind of the big projects for that school? Do we know what those numbers are going to look like? Oh, my name is Lillian. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, 
there, it's hard to go through every system, but a roof generally has a warranty period of 20 to 30 years. And, and that's what a new roof is going to be like as well. Um, so it's part of running buildings is, is needing to replace these roofs every, every so often. Uh, mechanical system components also typically have a lifespan of 25 years. Um, give or take, it depends what we're talking about. So um, we're not proposing a, a, a building that these different components are going to last longer than every other building around. It, it's, it's kind of the, that's the industry standard, if you will, and that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. The, the rest of the building, like the built-in parts of the building, the finishes, the structure, uh, we're looking at a 50-year minimum uh, lifespan for, for many of those. So we think about uh, a, a building working for its program and for, for the city for the next 50 years uh, before you'd have to replace it. But within that duration, you're going to have to do the roof two and a half times or whatever, or twice. Uh, and, and that's typically what's expected. During the tour, Dr. Melton has talked about some mold remediation that's been done. But is there still mold that's existing within the building? Are we going to need to see more remediation done going forward if we stay here? I'm going to turn to Bob here. Um, so we, we had to do some mold mitigation in one classroom that had some serious issues. We do have mildew in the subterranean floor level. Uh, and so we are adding dehumidifiers. dehumidifiers. We just put in for a purchase of, of additional dehumidifiers in those um, classrooms that need it the most. Um, we're also bringing over air filtration devices that we, portable air filtration devices that we had at Greylock that um, were part of our return to school following COVID pandemic. And so those are relatively new. We're bringing those over. And then do you want to speak to the CTC sure. air exchange? We're increasing the air exchange in lower levels by 75%. Um, we started that Monday. Um, everything we've done downstairs has been with the mindfulness of mold mitigation or, or spores. Um, carpet cleaning, disinfecting, paints with mildew uh, resistance. Uh, all those things that we've done will take care of. Um, so downstairs with the increase of the airflow, the air purifiers that we have, um, I'm also looking into UV lighting that could be added to the units that, that serves downstairs. So which also creates another mold or spore barrier, if there is. I just think of children who have respiratory issues and concerned about you know, any kind of mold that might be here. That's another we, benefit to the new school. We have, when we did the mold mitigation, we did test afterward to make sure that there was, the presence of spores was not at any level that it would cause respiratory issues. Um, but we're very sensitive to that. Um, the, the issue that we have is, that, you know, you said, will we need to do that again? Well, we're going to need to continue to do this, right? because it is subterranean. Right. Um, we have concrete spalling in that area. Uh, so there, and, and it gets moist. And with, you know, an older HVAC system, it gets, it was, it, it was tropical. That's the best way I can describe it. It was tropical downstairs during the, um, during the month of July. Everybody remembers how hot it was in July. Well, if that air gets into that subterranean level, it tends to sit. So when that, when that work is done, can the students be in the building or does that have to be done during a, a summer break or spring Summer break, break, Christmas break, February break, April break, yep. but we're, we're yep. you know, shampooing carpets, we're checking all of those rooms and then the daily mitigation has to happen. And that's where we'll be speaking to our teachers about making sure their dehumidifiers are on at the end of the day, that they leave their classroom door open to the hallway. Um, you know, and then Bob and, and his custodial staff will make sure that they're changing those filters on the air filtration devices and checking and monitoring will just be part of our, our maintenance plan. But, it, but it's something we have to continue to do. 
It's not going to be We do the interior filters, we do events four times a year. We do the roof <laughs> And that's filters are part of our contract with CTC, so it doesn't cost us anything. It's a just, it's just labor to do. Right. Okay. So first I want to thank uh, a couple of the city, former city councilors who I think brought up something that was very informative to me, which was that um, this building, if it stops being used as a school, indeed is still going to cost us money. What that amount of money is is not yet determined, but it could be tremendously significant. Um, so I just wanted to thank the two former city councilors who sort of brought up that line of um, discussion. Uh, and beyond that, the thing I wanted to ask there to you was that obviously in order to achieve getting the 19.6 million plus 30 years of interest requires a vote of the people, obviously because it's a two and a half debt exclusion. Um, so similarly, any amount greater than that realistically would require at some point, if not a debt exclusion, full prop two and a half because you can't borrow more money. You know, if you can't borrow 19.6 at 30 years plus interest, you're gonna have to clearly get other people, get people to vote to spend more. If we, if we don't get the financing, we have Right, right, so my, so my point, the question I'm leaning to is that, um, Clearly, if choice one is, in, because in some ways this has been framed of framed in the way of Ms. Shulman and McCad had mentioned, um, you know, as far as taxes, it had been it's been framed so much somewhat as a if you don't do number one, you gotta do number two. But clearly, if people don't vote for number one, the chance that they're gonna vote to then magically ask give you more money in, in a large sum is probably not likely. So. My question is, what what would be the true the true second option if you, if this is voted down? Clearly, you're not going to come to the people and ask them for 45 million after they told you notice 19.6. Okay. So, what would be your actual? What is the actual second thing? Because the slide makes it look like the second thing is the 45 million, but it can't be because if people vote down 19.6, so what what would? So, I'm encouraged that. We're going to have a positive vote. Okay, oh, maybe I've got well. maybe I've got my rosy sunglasses on, but I feel strongly that this is in the best interest of this community. Um, what we would do if we had to? Your question is if we have to stay in this building. Right. We can't go back, we can't go back to Greylock. We'll right. have to stay here, and we will navigate and make the best that we can. But eventually, it's going to come back to the taxpayers. Because if we have to put a new roof on this project and, and this building, we have to add it into the school budget. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, I can't predict no. what two years, three years from now will be. But I think that it, it's going to end up whether you pay it through a debt exclusion. But the important thing is with the debt exclusion, you're only paying that extra money through the life the of, of the 30 years. If we were to do a proposition two and a half, which I'm not proposing, I want to be very clear on that. It's a proposition two and a half over prop. You're not proposing. Correct. Correct. The debt inclusion is also two and a half. The debt exclusion falls under the same chapter as the Correct. proposition two and a half. Correct. We agree. Correct. It's the word. It, it, it's the word. definitely the word. It is the word. So okay. going back to your question, Joe, what will what will we do? Yeah. Unfortunately, it will go back. Have to be invested through the budget. And then that may force us. Um, the other thing is, as we add new growth, which we are, have added some new growth this year, that levy limit climbs as well, but not to the magnitude of a $45 million project. So I hope that I kind of answered your no, question. No, you totally answered my question. I really appreciate that. If I may ask a, a, a similar, similar vein follow-up then. Um, many people might not be aware, but uh, you know, when Cole Grove was finished in 2016, in essence, Sullivan certainly wasn't needed anymore. The city still owns Sullivan, correct? Um, the building has been subject to arson. Yes. And the city council, not many years ago, when it was presented with a plan to turn it in, into affordable housing so it could be come off the city's hands, actually voted it down. 
I don't think you were there. I was just going to say it was a higher number. Anyway, anyway, what I'm just asking is Sullivan is, I, I, I think it would be fair to say, an oligotrust around the neck of your administration. It is, but I will tell you that we've done an RFP for Sullivan School. We have two responders, which we're working on negotiating with the Department of Education. Right. Um, we have I'm probably a little more aggressive with the fact that we shouldn't own property that's not for public service sure. um, than maybe some of my predecessors. Um, so we're hoping to move that building at some point. Um, and the same would be true, you know, going back, I believe it was Council Harkin, Marie Harkin's question about, you know, what do we do with this building? That's something we're going to have to evaluate, you know. Um, but if we don't, if we are not successful with the debt exclusion, we'll have to come up with another plan. But it will, I mean, everything is on the backs of the taxpayer. No, understood. I, I guess, well, I just, I, let me ask you this then. On those RFPs, my understanding is that if it's below assessed value, then it has to go to city council, much like when Sullivan was denied being sold for affordable housing because. Yeah, Sullivan School has already been declared surplus property years ago. Okay. But my, my point is that much, basically, in certain circumstances, where we still are stuck with Sullivan, even though we built Cole Grove in 2016, and now it's X amount of years later, if we build Greylock and we shut this down as a school, if you if you or any other mayor seeks to sell this for less than assessed value, right, it'll have to go through the city council. Absolutely. And, and, and they previously have done things like nix affordable housing for- And have to declare surplus. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me go to Vic and then back to Paul. Thank you, thank you. I just want to talk, Joe, thank you for bringing up sure. Sullivan. Still, always still, love talking. Still, still an issue of heartburn for me, but right. it was, it is one of my deepest regrets from my tenure as mayor. I think when we built Cole Grove, I think I had this little rainbow and bluebirds above it, and I said, you know, something good, whether it be, a, you know, assisted, uh, uh, assisted living facility. Um, uh, some sort of affordable housing project. It never came to be. And I've talked to the mayor, Mayor will tell you, we've had several conversations about having a plan for this place because I didn't have a good plan. Right. And it's still sitting there. Uh, and, and, and it is an albatross around her neck and the neck of the city. Um, you know, what was or wasn't approved last year, whatever you said, I, I don't really know. But um, we do have to have a good plan for this place and the mayor understands that. I'll say another thing. Um, if tomorrow, if this gets voted down and we have this building, right, we're taking on, if we build it, we take on 19 or $20 million worth of debt, correct? And let me first say it's a debt exclusion. A debt exclusion is simply set aside by the state under the same chapter for a capital <laughs> project for a specific period of time. Typically a prop two and a half override is where you raise your levy limit to typically cover administrative costs. So if your budget exceeds whatever, you're paying police, you're paying fire, you're doing, that's typically why you set up a two and a half. This is not a two and a half. I want the community to understand that. The mayor's done the right thing by putting this underneath, sure. underneath that, that section. But if tomorrow we need a $10 million roof, unless the mayor's got gold bars under her desk that nobody knows about, it, it's yeah, going to sure. have to be paid for. It's going to have to be paid for. Right. The school doesn't have to be built but that would have to be paid for. And so whether or not, somehow the community is gonna to have to come together and take on significant debt, whether that's eight, nine, ten million million, $10 million, no reimbursements for that by from the state. So if we have to do that, we take on the debt. That's another long-term debt. And to Diane's point, there's still seven million owed on whatever. So that comes into our debt. The second thing is if, if it triggers other things, as Jesse's saying, and or other improvements trigger that, then you get into the ADA stuff. And if we're, instead of 45 million, if we're pushing $20 million, it's all gonna have to, I can't see or understand where it would not have to all be borrowed at some point down the road. Right. Okay. So yeah, let me just, just yeah, yeah, finish, yeah. finish this thought. And, and so, you know, again, we as a city for years through many administrations have, have been forced to kind of kick the can down the road. The state's coming at us with $40 million. We built coal Grove for 32 million. We borrowed eight or nine, I can't remember what it was. This is a $65 million project nine years later, eight or 10 years or whatever. When did Cold Grove open? Seven, 16, 17? Huh? 2016. 16. Yeah. 16. So eight years later, it's a $65 million project. 
if we can't get before the MSBA again for another seven to 10 years, the need is gonna be there. I don't think anybody in here can discount the idea that there'll be a need for a building. And if we go 10 years from now, what's that gonna look like? 120, 130, 140 million dollars. And then what are we gonna to have to borrow? And who are we leaning that, who are we laying that against? And what will the numbers look like then? And I, you know, I think from a, from a practical perspective, there's one thing that the city has going for it in the sense of finances is that we have a very, I know it sounds like a lot of money, seven million and 19, we have one of the lowest uh, debt ratios in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have in, almost infinite capacity to borrow this and borrow more. Um, it's hard to pay it back, I get it. And I, I understand that from everybody. But I'm just, my, my, my point is simply this, if we continue to kick the can down the road, we are gonna have a problem here. It's gonna have to be borrowed at some point in time. It's gonna have to be paid back. I'd much rather, and again, the mayor's gotta come up with a, a, a suitable reuse. And, but again, that's down the road. That's three years into the future, and I'm assuming the mayor will have uh, public discussions on that as it goes along. But that's, my point is simply this, is that we, we're gonna have to borrow it anyway. We have to borrow a lot of money anyway. I'd rather borrow money and pay on a brand new building than I would borrow money and patch things that still aren't, where you're still gonna to have to be patching and patching and patching. That's my point. Do we, uh, Michelle Casey, do we have an idea of how much it would cost to demolish and abate the Greylock site? Well, that's part of the project. Right, yeah. If we were not to pass the project, I'm saying, if, if oh, it was the right one. Oh, for demolition? Right. If we had to pay that out of pocket. Yeah. That's the main cost is 1.2 million, but then we'd have to add. Fair so to say. Let's say 1.5. That building is not going to be used. Right. Not by us. You're right. It's something you have to deal with that building. Something's building with a far better chance of, of having another reuse. Well, I am piggybacking my thoughts on former Bear Alpha Frank. The numbers we've seen for break have been saying 45 million. But everything that's been discussed tonight, it seems like if we have to do work to the building, it's gonna be done piecemeal. And as as work has to be done, a new loop, uh, HVAC system, electrical, got maybe sprinklers, things like that, and that number is gonna increase. It's gonna be above 45 million because costs go up as projects go up. Um, so really that's just an estimate that was done at some point. But we're not really looking at 45 million for here, we're really looking at 45 plus million, if I understand this correctly. Yeah. Or could be, or could be. You're Let's right. That way. The costs never come down, right? So if you do it later in time, it just costs more. That's right. So, so really, 19.6 million for something brand new, these 45 plus for the ongoing mandate. Right. Okay. So it's approaching 8.30. I'll take a couple more questions. I will stay to answer questions if you didn't get your question answered. Uh, let's go to Tammy. I have a question that I think Tim touched on slightly way back. Um, you're talking that if Greylock, if the debt proposal goes down, the end start putting, putting money to the school. We know that the state does not like to give you money to put into a building they don't think you should be in, especially if you have to go out to borrow. Now, has that been considered? <coughs> we know you have, which the city had to beg to put money into the fire station. That, that, that's, that's an issue. You know, if we stay here, could we jump on an accelerated program for just the roof, um, like other schools have done? Probably not, because we've exceed our life, you know, we're close to exceeding our life expectancy. Um, you know, they, you know, it's it's not just, again, us making these decisions. The MSA, MSBA has a whole group of professional, independent architects and engineers who, who look at all the property and say, you know, even if we came in with a renovation, they'd probably say we were crazy. That's that's kind of the feeling we, we, we get. Um, I want to go, I saw a hand over here, but I don't, Jet, just two quick questions. 
as the MSBA or any other anyone cited this building as being out of compliance to operate as a school for code violations or any anybody, whether it be city, state, or federal government. So, so the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, has a process that they are <coughs> bringing back to life again. Um, it used to be called the PQA, then it was the CDSA. It's their uh, process by which they evaluate a district um, based on, on a set of standards and indicators. So they just revised the set state standards and in, uh, state district standards and indicators, um, and that was just released this month, August 2024, by the commissioner the acting commissioner, Russell Johnson. So that, that in those standards and indicators, it includes a component by which they evaluate uh, through finances, building and operations, and then also through capital improvement, planning and maintenance of buildings. And so uh, we have received reports that are available on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website where they kind of describe their assessments of buildings. However, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is not in the business of telling municipalities of whether or not a school can run or not. That is a local decision um, based on the municipality. Um, they would, the municipality needs to make the decision that a school is no longer able to meet the educational needs of the students. Okay, so let me ask you the question. So school committee, school building committee, city council, <coughs> governing agencies. Okay, so let me repeat my question. Has the Department of Justice or ADA deemed the school to be out of compliance or any state or city found a violation or a code violation that will not allow the school to operate as a school? So we have had, um, through the Office of Civil Rights, we have had findings that have been individually put forward as a complaint. Um, and that would be the only governmental agency that I could say would indicate that we were, quote, out of compliance. Is there an order now to fix ADA compliance in this building? So that is what Jesse was referring to earlier. So there is there isn't one currently. We have an elevator in this building. We actually are in better shape with ADA compliance here than we were at Greylock because that building did not have an elevator and did have a second floor. Students had to go around the building to enter into that side if they were in a wheelchair or had crutches, things like that. So so there was um, some issues at Greylock with regards to ADA compliance, but when you start a project on a <coughs> municipal building, you can in fact trigger uh, that review that requires that you ensure that your building is an ADA compliant. Sorry, so the answer is no. Yeah. In terms of a government agency, no. We, with the Office of Civil Rights complaint that we received, we did have to provide transportation from Greylock to another building for the students who could not access the second floor. But so not in Bray but not at Brayton. Not at Brayton. Okay. Okay. And I have one more question if you don't mind. I have attended all the meetings either in person or online. And I'm I'm having a hard time understanding some numbers and I know everybody's familiar with everything all over Facebook, so let's clear them up if we can while we're here. Um, you're giving some projection numbers based on enrollment, I believe, with MSBA. Uh, I'm not really sure where the numbers came from now because they're, they are different. And you The Massachusetts us, School Building Authority does their own enrollment projection, and that is what they use to determine the square footage, and which ultimately determines your design parameters and the cost of the building. That all comes through the MSBA's development of their projected enrollment. Understood. Through 2025? No, through 2030. Okay. This committee presented online at this, in this building for a meeting. Um, Berkshire Regional Planning Commission's numbers on a slide that you had shared was what was based, how you based this whole entire project. Those went through 2035. The MSBA 
does use other reports, and I did submit to them the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission report, as well as the NESDEC report that was authorized by the school committee. So okay. those reports are also considered through the MSBA. So if you just uh, let me, just let me finish my question, if you don't mind. When did you change those numbers? Because the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission numbers that you presented just before this project went to vote put our estimate of total students for 2035 at 350. I've never changed any numbers. I'm not sure what you're asking. I'll, I'll send you the slide tomorrow. The projected numbers for 2035 through Berkshire Regional Planning Commission are 350 total students from K to 6. Those would easily be housed in one school, not needing a second school. We need but to think those numbers have somehow disappeared, so I'm trying to find out where they went to. I've never, I don't, I've never posted the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission report because it may, it was presented to school committee, so it might have been in one of their packets. Um, yes, it was. If you read the full report, they, they say explicitly in that report that there is an issue specifically with North Adams um, because our numbers, if you read through the entire report, one of the issues that they had was the change in birth rate. So because a projection is always based on prior data and there was a significant change in the birth rate. And so they said that those numbers for North Adams needed further study. That says it right in that report through the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Sarah, um, I just had a question about that 350 number. You said that was K through six. Mm -hmm. How many pre-K? Because we have that as well. If it doesn't, they don't do pre-K. Okay. But it's so 350. Right. Let's count the 91 that we're saying we have now that still only was a set four hundred. Right, but the building, Cold Grove can only house, was it 420? Cold Grove is 420, and uh, Brave is 449, I think. Your point is a good one, too, because the pre-K takes a lot of space. So for, you get 15 students in the classroom pre-K, so you need more classroom space than for the upper range. Also, the pre-K is a pretty significant sell for the North Adams public school system, which I think is the thing that people are not maybe taking into account. I moved from a place with no pre-K to North Adams, and one of the large reasons that we moved to where we moved was the access to the pre-K program. But I'm sorry, I just I, I moved from a, from a different state to North Adams, and where they don't have pre-K access like this, and it's a significant sell for the North Adams public schools is the access to pre-K. So I think that's something that is important to take consideration when you talk about pre-K and numbers, part of what is putting us and keeping us in the North Adams Public Schools is the access to an extensive pre-K program. So, And it, and the class size of 15 is because it's an inclusive pre-K, and so there, there needs to be a number of typical peers to students who may have an IEP. Uh, many of our students who have an IEP are coming to us through um, EI. Uh, early intervention, and so they their spot for every one of, of the students who have an IEP, there needs to be two typical peers. And so it's predetermined the composition of the class and, and, and the Office of Early Elementary, uh, Early Education and Care, uh, they put that cap on the class size as 15. I just want to make sure anybody who has not talked yet, anyone who would like to speak, Gail. So I just want to say, like before, everybody was thanking everybody who did the process before because I wasn't on it. And I want to thank everybody to where we got to this point where you even got this plan up there to even have a new school in North Adams because they must have worked very hard to get us to this point. And the other thing is, I want to thank the NBC, A, if I'm saying that wrong, but. Can you guys go a little higher? Maybe to 50 million would be great if that's a possibility. But I really thank you for the money that's on the table. And I think we all need to say <laughs> what money that you're given, what money that we have to pay, which is not always that way. But, and I want to say that everybody in here, we all care about North Adams. I love North Adams in my heart and soul. 
and I say everybody in here is all interested and cares about it, we should all do our due diligence and we are doing that now. Get educated, make a real conscious decision when you go because it's for the people. The mayor wants it, that's okay. People want it, they don't want it. But the whole thing is, is we have the freedom to go and vote and make our decision on October 8th, whatever's good for your conscience or whatever's the city or your children. I asked you to go in there and get educated. We're getting a format. I didn't know all this stuff, so I'm really thankful to learn about what's going on. So when I go into the voting booth, I'm gonna make a conscious decision for the great city of North Adams. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Really quick. Um, the one thing that I wanted to point out, ADA triggering has come up a lot, and I invite anybody to read articles about the roof that was put on the public safety building, just from the perspective of just because you trigger, trigger ADA doesn't mean you have to follow through with it. You can actually apply for an exception and easily be potentially granted the exception. That's exactly what happened with the public safety building. 500K roof, that's all that had to be done. Um, didn't have to do anything with ADA because an exception was given by the federal government. That's not all that needs to be done in that building. No, 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 what I mean is, what, no, no, you need a new one. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Well. Don't forget that, you gotta pay for that. So thank you all for coming. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to us. We appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On your way out, tell Bob you did a great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you have the time for it? I did. 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 I did.